Okay. I think uh, I think we might make a start anyway. Any 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 last minute stragglers can can squeeze onto the chairs on the back row. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen there so you can get a good look at me and Kev. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Martin Valley, and I am uh, Director of Operations here at Cheshire Wildlife Trust. With me, I've got Kev Feeney, who is um, Living Landscape Manager for uh, our area west. And we are here to share with you some, some great news for Cheshire. After a couple of years of trying and a couple of false starts, we're really pleased to be able to say that we are going to be bringing back beavers to Cheshire. You may have heard in the news um, some of the stories about beavers in other parts of the country. It's happening in some uh, a few parts of the country and, and now we're on that list as well. So over the next hour or so, we want to share with you um, our plans for bringing back beavers um, and how you can help and maybe give you some insight into what the beavers might do, why we think they're good, and also give you an opportunity to uh, ask us some questions and to find out a little bit more about these exciting plans that we've got. So as I say, with me is Kev. Say, I, I say hello, Kev. Good evening, hello. So Kev is, uh, is the reserve manager at Hatchmere Nature Reserve. And this is where we're gonna be reintroducing the beavers, hopefully um, in a couple of months time. So he's here to give us some expert tips on what we can expect on site and how we're gonna go about doing it. Um, and I'm going to start off with a small presentation about um, where we are with beavers, how we got there, why they're so important, what's happening across Europe with beavers, just to give you some little background. As Kev said um, early on, if you do want to participate, we'd love to hear you your, 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 have a bit of a chat with you. We would love to um, hear, have some questions. We will try and get to the questions later on. Um, and if you see at the bottom, you'll see a little tab which says Q&A. So click on that, put your questions in there, and we will um, endeavor to answer them. If we're really lucky, we might try and get you to speak up, but we're not, we're not that good at Zoom yet, so we don't know whether we're gonna be able to actually get people to answer questions. But hopefully, if we haven't answered the questions within the presentations, we should be able to answer them as you put them on there. So put your, put your questions in the Q&A, put your chats in the chat, let us know what your thoughts are. Um, and as far as what to expect from this evening, as I say, I'm going to start off with a bit of a presentation, then there'll be a couple of videos. Kev's going to do a bit of a presentation, and then we'll look at the questions you've, you've posed to us about what this, um, this exciting um, project is going to do for Cheshire. Just to let you know that we are, um, we, are, we are recording this video tonight, so if you want to hear it again, you can you get a link at the end, um, and you can, you can hear again and pick up some of the things perhaps you missed first time around. So if, you've, if you have emailed and you've joined through, a, through an events booking, then we're taking that as, as permission for you to, for us to, to, to video you tonight. I shouldn't worry about using Zoom. We can't see you. So if you're sat there in your pajamas, that's absolutely fine. We can't see you. We can't hear you. But just that we, we would let you know that. So without any further ado, um, I'm just going to start with a, a short presentation about how we've got to this point with Beavers before we hand over to Kev. So, I am just going to share my screen. Hopefully this will work. You've seen this slide already, but um, put it up again. Okay, so here we are, beavers in Cheshire. How did we get here? But just before we start, I want, to, I want to try a little quiz just to get you all in the beaver mood and also to test your bit of knowledge about, about beavers. So we've got 10, 10 beaver questions on the screen and, I, and I'm going to go through them one at a time and uh, after each question what I'll do is I'll put the answer up on screen so you can test yourselves as we go along. So the first question is quite often asked about beavers is do beavers eat fish? So I'll give you a couple of, couple of, couple of seconds to think about that, just, just an instinctive answer, do beavers eat fish? And then we'll give you the answer. Um, so do beavers eat fish? The answer is false, they don't eat fish. So if we've got any fishermen Join to tonight, we don't have to worry about beavers eating the fish because they're, um, they're herbivores, so they just eat, just eat plants and they don't, eat, um, they don't eat animals. Question number two, beavers' teeth never stop growing. Um, what do we think about that answer? Is it true or false? Beavers' teeth never stop growing? The answer to that is true. They never stop growing and you can imagine why they, they, they don't stop growing because they're always gnawing at, 
um, trees and, uh, and building the dams so in order they need to keep their teeth have to keep growing because they keep getting worn down as they as they chew away at the, at the trees question number three is a bit of a tricky one beavers are native to england do you think that's true or false um true or false beavers are native to england now i'm going to say true and we can have a bit of a debate about that if you like but um they, the, the, the history behind it is, is that they were here, people think, say, 400 years ago. Um, and they were here before, prior to that, but they haven't been um, in our country for the last 400 years. And this is why we're trying to bring them back, because although we haven't seen them for a long time, they would be part of our natural fauna over the centuries, and they have helped to build this landscape. So, so we're saying it is, that they are true. Question number four is also a bit controversial. Beavers cause flooding. Is that true? That is, of course, absolutely true. If you're going to block up a river with, with sticks and um, it's a tree, then you're going to slow the flow, you're going to hold the flow back. And they do cause small-scale flooding upstream of where they build their dams. And that, that does cause controversy. And obviously, everything about a new speech, species like beavers is not necessarily going to be good. And, and those, this is kind of the debate we need to have, is how do we, how do we get the best out of beavers and manage the, 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 the negative impacts? Here's another question, question number five. Do, do beavers scare off other wildlife? Are they, are, they, are they frightening predators like a wolf? The answer to that is false. In fact, if anything, um, introducing a beaver to an area will increase that wildlife as it modifies the habitat. Uh, you'll get more insects at the bottom of the food chain, which lead to more birds, and um, it, it actually helps increase the amount of, amount of uh, wildlife in an area. Number six, pretty easy one. If you've not done so well on the first five questions, do beavers chop, beavers chop down trees? Is that true or false? That is true. Anybody that's seen any programs about beavers or seen any of the activity they do will know that they, they build their dams by chopping down trees. Um, here's, a, here's a question which I think is quite amazing. Um, the world, this is a true or false, remember? So the world's largest beaver dam is 85 feet long. Seems pretty long, doesn't it? But actually, that is, that's, a, that's a false. The world's largest beaver dam is, in fact, 850 metres long. And uh, you can see it from space. So if you want to look on the internet, you can see a photograph of the world's largest beaver dam. So they can build pretty large beaver dams. I don't think the ones that we're hoping to reintroduce can build 850 metre dams, but they, they probably will build perhaps eight, eight feet dams, perhaps not 80, 850 metres. So then a question about the colour of beaver's teeth. Beaver's teeth are yellow. Is that true or false? It is false. Beaver's teeth are a funny colour, but it's not yellow, it's orange. And that's orange because the, um, they are, there is iron in the enamel on their teeth. So they've got really strong teeth for gnawing at trees. And that iron colour in the enamel makes their teeth orange. So it's not that they haven't been to the dentist or they don't clean their teeth. It's actually that they have got iron within the enamel. Question number nine is a bit, of a, a, bit of a bit of an interesting one as well, a bit of a fun um, question. Can beavers fly? Maybe you think that's false, but actually they can fly. Um, and the story behind this is that actually is that in, in, in America, at the end of the Second World War, when they were just beginning to wonder what to do about beavers, there was a case where um, some beavers had been a nuisance in, in one part of the country and they wanted to get rid of them. So they put them in an aeroplane and they, made, and they gave them special crates with parachutes on and they flew to a remote area where they could drop down these beavers and they released the beavers and the parachutes uh, flew open, they floated down to the ground. When they landed, the boxes broke open and the beavers, the beavers um, went out of the boxes and started to colonise a new area. So they can fly if you put them in a plane. They don't have wings, but you can, you can get them to fly. Then question number 10, the final question, beavers always build dams. Is that, is that true or false? Well, that is false. Beavers build dams because their natural habitat or where they prefer to be is, is in a certain depth of water. So what they want to do is to create that safe habitat where they can move around uh, within, a, within a water environment where they feel um, very secure. They're good underwater and they're less good um, on the land. So if that level, if that layer of water is not there, if that, if that depth of water is not there, they just build the dams to create that depth of water in which they feel safe. So if you put a beaver, introduce a beaver into a lake, the chances are it won't make any dams because that lake is deep enough for them to feel safe as it is. 
that's just a bit of a few questions to see what your, your general knowledge of beavers was like. Now let's uh, let's look at what a beaver is like. We've got a there's a picture of it here. You can see with the big paddle shaped um, tail and kind of quite big clawy type feet. Uh, they're about uh, a meter tall, so they're quite big. Somebody described it as like a Labrador. Um, you know, they're quite heavy, fiercely territorial. Um, and I have heard it say in the, in the, I think in the Devon beaver trial, they have sort of attacked a dog. It can be fierce if you get, if you get close to them, but generally they, they just uh, mind their own business. They're semi-nocturnal, so you often don't see them unless you're prepared to come out at night. And they're very comfortable in the water. They can, they can swim quite fast in the water because they've got this big tail, which helps them to paddle. All right. So what's that, where are we with beavers in, in, in Europe? I mean, the thing about where we are in England is everybody is very interested in beavers and there's a lot of concern or there's a lot of uncertainty or, around them. But actually people have been reintroducing beavers now for a um, hundred years across Europe. So if you go back to the start of the 20th century, beavers were virtually extinct in, in Europe. Um, and this map, pretty much shows that the area where they were is this green area here. There was very few areas or this, I think, and so the green area was the only remaining area in Europe. There was just a few pockets of them. Um, and this map here shows where they are in Europe now. So over the last hundred years, um, slowly people have been reintroducing beavers into Europe. Um, so the, the idea of reintroducing beavers is not a new idea. And actually any lessons that we need to learn in, in England at somewhere somebody in Europe has already gone through that. So we don't need to worry too much about what the beavers are going to do because we're already, we're already pretty familiar. We can just go to France or Germany and we can say, what did you do when you had this problem? So, so, so we're just at the, the beginning of a journey that other countries have already been through over the last century. If we just take a few of those examples just to show that you know, we're, on this, we're on this journey, beavers in Bavaria, which is possibly the country with the most beavers that have been reintroduced they started uh, reintroducing them about 50 years ago and now there there are something like 35,000 beavers in Germany and about 18,000 beavers in Bavaria so they're quite naturalized in Bavaria and you don't very often hear news stories about terrible things that beavers are doing in Bavaria everybody there quite accepts them and they have a really good management system so so we can learn lessons from places like Bavaria that Bavaria is where we might be in 50 years time and they're mostly down to this man. He's the, he's the, he's, he's the guy who single-handedly reintroduced them to much of Europe. This is a guy called Gerhardt. He, he maybe looks more like a, 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 a punk, a, a, a heavy metal man or a hippie or something, but actually he's been in charge of the reintroductions in, to beavers in Bavaria. And, and, and what they've done there is excess beavers that they've had, they then used them to reintroduce them to other countries of Europe. So Bavaria was sort of a feeding country for, for beavers in the rest of Europe. And in the early, early days of reintroductions in England, we were getting beavers from Bavaria um, where there is a bit, sometimes there's a problem with beavers that are in the wrong place or are um, eating neighbors' apple trees or uh, making farming difficult. They would move these beavers and they would come to England. So this is the type of thing which beavers do. On the right here, you can see the couple of dam that they build, a large dam with, with uh, trunks of trees which they, they've um, gnawed down and they've moved across to make this big dam and behind there you can see the lake which is, which is as I say the place where they feel safe and confident but it can have problems. So here there's a kind of a road that has been disturbed by um, subsidence from flooding or from the changing water course which, which beavers have created and there's quite a large um, piece of work in Bavaria for guys like this to work with landowners to resolve problems. So here we go, here's some ways which beavers, have, problems of beavers have been resolved. If, then, if there's a tree you don't want to chop down, you can put one of these mesh fences around it. Um, you can perhaps move the beavers, or in some cases, this is a pen here at the bottom left, you can see for translocating beavers that, that are awkward. And as I say, this is how the first beavers came over. They would be awkward beavers from, from Germany, and then they would be sort of um, imported into England. So what about in, in the UK then? Um, you may say, well, we've had, not had beavers for centuries. You know, how do we know that they were ever here? Well, this on the, on the picture on the left here, this is, um, this is from Carlisle, where my parents, my in-laws live. 
There's a Beaver Road, which I give a little cheer every time we drive past. Um, on the right is a picture of Beverly, which is, uh, which is a derivative of, of Beaverly. So it shows that the place names which we have in the UK show us that in the past, beavers were here. Any of you who've been to our headquarters um, down at Bickley Hall Farm, we have a mere um, around on our walk around the farm, which is called Barmia, which again is a derivative of beaver mere. So we know from place names that the beavers have been here. On this map, you can see, um, this map shows you where the beavers are in the UK at the moment. So the green areas are the wild populations, the red areas are the reintroduced populations. So in Scotland, there's quite a lot of, of wild populations in Scotland. There's a few in England, and then there's a lot of these red dots which show you the reintroduction sites that have happened. And we'll, we'll maybe touch, touch on some of those. So there isn't, as you can see yet, a dot for Cheshire, but hopefully this, this map will be updated in the next couple of months when we have a Cheshire dot. So our reintroduction is gonna be the 10th reintroduction um, in, the UK, in, in England. So the first place they came to um, in England was, was well, in the UK was Scotland. And in, in the early 2000s, um, there, was a, there, was an, there was the idea that we should, really be, we should really have beavers in the UK. and We should do something about that. So there was a plan in place to try and bring beavers back. Um, and there was a trial put in, in in the 2000s. And that trial was successful. Um, and there was also a wild population on the Tay. Some of you may know about this. And this map here, you can see this is kind of the outline of Scotland here. This is Dundee, I think, here. River Tay is coming in here. All these little blobs um, illustrate what they, what they say is a, is a beaver family. So when the most recent survey was done about three or four years ago, they found over a hundred beaver families living wild on the River Tay. And then on the other side of Scotland, there was, a, there was a trial going on that was run by Scottish National Heritage and the Scottish Wildlife Trust. So, so Scotland is about uh, 10 or, or 15 years ahead of where we are in England terms of beavers being reintroduced and, and again you know beavers are not all good news and they were causing a lot of problems in Scotland sometimes they would they would take a tree down next to a road they might erode a bank here on the right hand side they might clog up a culvert which could increase the sort of flooding and here again they're they're, they're doing some damage to to farmland so it, it's not always been uh, easy for the beavers and where they are in Scotland now is they're just beginning to um, work out a way to manage them. So they really do need managing and they're managed in Bavaria and they will uh, sort of need to be managed in England as well. And there are ways that you can do it. So, you, you know, you can, you, you, can, uh, you can destroy the dams, you can paint your trees with, with sort of paint that the beavers don't like. You can actually, this on the top right here, this is called a beaver deceiver. And what they're trying to do here is to, is to trick the beaver into, into, into um, not building dams and to being happy with flowing water. At the last resort, what you can do is you can remove the beaver and take it somewhere else. And this is, I might say this a bit later on, but this is how we're going to get our beaver from Scotland. It will be a beaver that's a bit of a, a, bit of a troublemaker in Scotland uh, and we'll be able to give him a space in England. So some of you may have heard about the, the Devon beavers, They're possibly the most well-known site in, 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 in England. There was a, a wild release in Devon. There was also a, a release in an enclosure. So two, two different releases there. And you might have heard on the news um, that the, the, the wild release in Devon has just been allowed to stay, which is quite a, an exciting um, piece of news for England. Here we go. This is the, just from taken from the BBC website. So there was a, it was a five, you can see there, look at those orange teeth there, the enamel, from the, from the, from the iron from the enamel there, showing up on the orange teeth. Um, so the, 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 the wild release was a trial that DEFRA were um, involved in and they said you can stay for five years and then we'll make a decision about whether you can remain. And the government have just agreed to allow them to stay, which has sort of opened, opened the, the door for, for what happens next for beavers. Um, and I'm just going to, in a minute, I'll, oh, this, is, this is another site, so in the Forest of Dean, um, again, this is an enclosed site. So in the UK, you can either have wild releases or you can have enclosed releases. And as Kev will probably say later, ours is going to be an enclosed release where you have to create a fence like this. Um, and there are a number of these um, enclosed sites across, um, across England. But now the government has said that this wild population can stay. 
they will now have to make a decision about what to do about wild populations in the UK. And those of you who follow this on the Wildlife Trust's um, network, you'll know that we've been campaigning to get the government to uh, come up with a strategy. Now that they've agreed to let the Devon beavers stay, they, they will have to do that. It's forced their hand a little bit. So what about beavers for Cheshire? I'm just going to stop there because that's started to get into Kev's, Kev's arena. What I do want to share, share with you is a little video from Harry Barton, who is the, uh, the CEO of Devon Wildlife Trust. Um, just following on from that, what I'd said there about Devon and how Devon is now going to be able to release their beavers and, and the, wild, the wild population there is now allowed to stay. And um, I'm just going to Harry had a message, which I'd like to share with you all, because it's quite, quite interesting at this time to see what's happening elsewhere in the country. So here's, here's, um, here's Harry for you. Hello there from down here in rainy Devon. It's been an amazing day for the beavers. Uh, this morning, Minister Rebecca Powell announced that the beavers can remain on the River Otter. And not only that, they'll be allowed to spread to neighbouring catchments. It's a better result than we dared hope for and we're over the moon. We've had all sorts of media coverage, overwhelmingly positive, and it's telling that the minister in a statement to the press talked about the benefits that beavers bring to water quality and flood alleviation, resilience to the landscape in the face of climate change, as well as all the biodiversity benefits. Over the next few months, we can expect DEFRA to consult on its national approach to licensing and future beaver releases, and the Wildlife Trust will be right in the middle of that process, trying to influence it as best we can. We should be aware that not everyone is pleased with this decision, and we know that some fishing groups in particular have lobbied hard against it, and we shouldn't be surprised if there's a counter-offensive in the coming weeks. But we have the evidence and the public support to keep this on track and do everything we can to make sure that beavers can spread across England with the protection that they deserve. So thank you all very much for your support. Best of luck to everyone out there running their own or planning their own beaver projects. Happy days. Okay, so that was Har Happy Harry. He's very pleased that his beavers can now stay. Um, and now I'm going to hand over to Kev, and Kev is going to tell us a bit more about our plans for Delamere. So you can remember, keep your questions coming, keep the chat coming. I shall do my best to, to, to reply to the questions. All right, Kev, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Martin. Ooh, are we gonna are we gonna work today? We're on, we're working. Okay, so as Martin mentioned, uh, I'm one of the living landscape officers at Cheshire Wildlife Trust. I'm also the site manager for Hatchmere. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about the Delamere Beaver project specifically. Um, it's been three years in the making to get this project to where we are now, and I'm gonna try and cram it into about 15 minutes. And I do apologise if it sounds at first like a bit of a science lesson, but um, here we go. So, Hatchmere Nature Reserve. Uh, Hatchmere Nature Reserve has been with Cheshire Wildlife Trust for about 20 years. It's a triple SI, that's a site of special scientific interest. This is a legal designation given to sites due to their rare flora and fauna that are found there. Uh, in particular for Hatchmere, we've got a mere, uh, we've got floating raised bog, we've got wet woodland, and we've got wet heathland. And these are all wetland sites, but they're also on peat soils, so it's very acidic ground, uh, and it's quite rare for the UK to have this. Um, pre kind of industrialization of the UK, uh, over 90% of our soils would have been peat, and now they were down to kind of around 5%. And when we lose all this soil, we lose all the plants and the animals that go with it. So it's quite an important site to still have here in Cheshire. Uh, it's a good home to a range of wildlife. We've got Good um, reptiles right across the Alamere Forest, also dragonflies and butterflies. But they're only there because of plants, and plants kind of support ecosystems, they're the foundation. And you can see here that we've got a round leaf sundew. This is a carnivorous plant, like a Venus flytrap, and what it does is it traps insects, um, breaks them down, and provides its own food. And that's because the habitat is really low in nutrients. And that's what we need for Hatchmere to maintain those ecosystems and those habitats. Uh, tiny plants, they're really small, um, and they support really small ecosystems of all the insects. This is a spider survey. We actually use a hoover on, um, with a sock over it to kind of suck up insects from the moss. Uh, and basically we can ID them a little bit later on. Um, these insects are adapted to this environment and they can't cope with pressure. And pressures come in many forms. 
for Hatchmere, uh, this is a really straight ditch. It's a pretty common site right across Cheshire, right across the UK, in fact. And it's man-made. This serves kind of one function. It's to get water off of land, uh, to get water away from roads as quick as possible, to open up farming, open up forestry, kind of make land usable for agriculture. But it's not natural, and it doesn't allow natural processes to take place. So anything that goes in this, so the water carrying loads of nutrient, loads of silt, it rushes out as fast as it can. And wherever it ends up and accumulates, that's where high levels of nutrients are found. That's when you get things like this. This is the common stinging nettle. And it's common for a few reasons, really. It likes high nutrient levels, but it's big and it's a very dominant plant. And when this kind of spreads onto our peat soils, like in Hatchmere, it tends to outcompete everything else. And we see a loss of the plants that are there and then all the species that go with them. Also trees. I'm a big fan of trees. I love trees. Um, a lot of what I do at the Trust involves trees. But you can see the photo on our left. Uh, we've got quite a closed canopy. This is at Hatchmere. And the result is a loss in biodiversity. You can see the ground flora. There's just basically bracken there. And then there's a few fairly mature oak trees, which isn't much in terms of plant diversity. Equally, to kind of challenge your view on whether we should have beavers. Um, in the UK, we're missing many of the mammals that would manage or naturally graze or deal with the trees when they're younger. And the picture on the right is, it's a common feature. If you walk along a lot of the rivers in Cheshire or you walk along a lot of the brooks, it's big trees falling over. So I would challenge the opinion that maybe these trees just shouldn't be there in the first place. They should be managed and kept small. Um, this takes a lot of time to deal with. It creates problems down the road. So, our problems. We've got poor water quality entering Hatchmere Nature Reserve, and the rare plants cannot compete with the dominant vegetation. And they can't deal with the high levels of nutrient coming in. And we get a loss of rare plants and animals. What do we need? Well, we need clean water. That's what's going to solve the problem. But clean water is a difficult issue when you're looking at a catchment. Water travels a long way across a lot of land. So how do you kind of filter this out? Well, there's a solution. And we think it's beavers. Uh, not all heroes wear capes. Uh, some have big teeth. Um, fat tails and they like to eat trees really and this is our plan we want to bring beavers back to Cheshire this is our Hatchmere Nature Reserve and you can see on the top left uh, a 10 acre beaver zone so this is going to be an enclosure where we plan to release a pair of beavers and running through the enclosure is Hatchmere Brook it's one of the main inflows into the Hatchmere Lake and it flows pretty straight. The uh, photo I showed you earlier on of the ditch is nutrient flowing through the site really quick. Nothing really natural taking out any of that nutrient. We're going to release a pair of beavers and then they'll use natural processes to filter the water flowing into Hatchmere. What will the beavers do? Well, they'll coppice trees. Uh, they, I was quite surprised when I went to visit a few sites. They'll take on anything uh, and they can directional fell. They can point trees towards water. And there's a few reasons for this. They want to feed from water where it's safe. Uh, they also strip bark and they eat so, uh, young shoots. But it's also about managing the area around them. There's a lot of effort goes into following this, um, to felling this tree. But I mentioned before, it's coppicing trees. So the stump will actually send out new shoots and regrow. So there's no loss to woodland. You've just got a different way of managing trees. And this is a photo a little bit further down the line. Um, I mentioned before that trees grow big canopies and they shade out the ground and you, with no sunlight and lots of moisture being sucked up by the tree, you don't get ground vegetation. Here you can see a tree has been felled and there's a whole diversity of new plant life coming up. Uh, this plant life can take up uh, loads of nutrients from the ground, from the water, adding to that kind of filtering effect. And there'll be built dams. This dam is about six foot high. Um, can't quite see the person on the right, but uh, there was a person next to it. Um, these dams will slow the flow of water. They'll hold it back, so all that vegetation will have time to filter the water. Uh, this is the top of the same dam. It's about 15 meters across, and I took this photo during really heavy rainfall. 
and you can see the kind of brown staining to the water. What would usually happen during heavy rainfall is mud from ploughed fields or from exposed ground gets washed into our water courses, gets pushed downstream, and it causes other kind of issues further down. And you can see that the mud has been stopped in its tracks. Uh, the water is still flowing, it's just being held and slowed down. This is the bottom of the same dam. Uh, you can see that the water on the ground, um, it's a lot clearer. A lot of that mud and silt has been taken out. So we've had that kind of filtering effect. You can see in the background the number of trees that have been coppiced. And again, the kind of green vegetation, which again supports loads more wildlife. There's a few more dams. Um, they put dams in in kind of a terrace effect. So they'll step them along the water course and hold water back as much as they can. Nice and clean. This water was about 10 foot deep, so it is a fairly deep dam. So we've got our beavers. We're going to release them into Hatchmere. They're going to coppice trees. They're going to create dams. But it's kind of what's the whole benefit of that? Well, this is our Hatchmere beaver enclosure. What flows through there, fast as you like, straight out and straight into our mere. Putting a series of dams in, letting beavers do natural processes will slow this flow, clean the water, and hopefully provide the ideal habitat in Hatchmere for lots of our small peatland plants and peatland animals to survive. And someone mentioned in the comments earlier, I think it was Alan, um, he said it was it's local to Cheshire, Cheshire West. Well, if you think about it on a wider scale, clean water affects everyone. The Hatchmere, you can see the blue box just up here. That's where our enclosure will be. Um, the purple outlines are peat basins that Cheshire Wildlife Trust has restored uh, in partnership with um, Forestry England over many years. And a lot of what we do to restore these peat basins is put in dams to raise water levels and remove trees, something that beavers will do without water going over my wellies or any of our volunteers' wellies, which is much easier. It's also more sustainable. But further down the line, Hatchmere does have an outflow. It comes, water flows out of Hatchmere and it kind of trickles through the forest, uh, keeps on going through a lot of farmland, forms a wider brook, changes its name a few times and ends up in the River Weaver near Dutton Locks. Uh, the Weaver, the top end, you've got um, the Dane, River Dane, and flowing downward, uh, you'll end up in the Mersey. So you've got that kind of greater effect. But for us, what we want to see is kind of a change in attitude. This is a small project to begin with. Bringing beavers to Cheshire will give us the opportunity to educate public, educate other landowners of the benefits of having beavers. And if we can have beavers in Cheshire, then we can improve a lot of land for wildlife and help kind of reverse that decline in wildlife that we see so often. But what we need to do first is we need to build our enclosure. Over the past three years, Martin and I and a few partners, have we've got our licenses in place. We now have the permission uh, to do so, but we need to build that enclosure. We need to put fencing like this in. And uh, what we need to do, we need to raise 30,000 pounds to install a bee proof fence and pre prepare the site by mid-September before the winter weather arrives. It is a tight uh, schedule. The second reason, um, we need to give our beavers time, uh, kind of in the autumn, to build winter food sources. And time is really not on our side at the moment. So we need to raise the funds as soon as we can. So you're gonna see a lot of media releases in the coming weeks, uh, a lot of posts on our social media. Uh, and we need to raise these funds as quick as we can. So we can hopefully bring beavers back as soon as possible. And who knows, maybe next spring, we might even see the first beaver kids born in Cheshire in over 400 years. Bring back the beavers. You can help. You can reply to our peer mail, uh, peer mailing um, for members. Uh, you can donate to our crowdfunder on the link below and you can donate on our website. As I said, if you follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, You'll see lots of posts coming up about it very soon. Okay. Right, that's great, Kev. Thanks. Questions coming thick and fast on the Q and A, so that's good. Keep those coming. 
Um, if you, are you, have you given me about the screen now? Ooh, I can't see what's working on it. There we go. Okay. Thank Brilliant. you very much. Right. So what we want to do now, it's getting dark in my room. Um, um, we've just got a short video, a flyover of the uh, proposed release site. We thought it might be interesting just for you to get, get a real flavour of what the site currently looks like um, and um, how it might be transformed. Because one of the most amazing things about Beaver sites is that you sometimes you can never believe what, what, they, what, they, what they're able to do. So we have put a lot of baseline data down and done loads of surveys and we can try and see what difference they really make. And, and watching this video, um, will definitely help us to see sort of where we are now and you know therefore we can compare and have a look at what it might look like in the future so i'm just going to put this up and hopefully it'll give you a bit of a flavor for what to expect so here we go and we're off can you see that all right kev is that coming through I can see that all right so so you can just you and me, Kevin and I will just talk you through. We can see the, the bit at the bottom. That's the that's the extension, isn't it, Kevin? At the bottom there. Yes. Yeah, so we're flying across the top of the enclosure now. There's a faint line where the current ditch that runs through. That's the most open. Part. You see my mouse is just there. That's where the little pond is. Where we're going to try and reintroduce them. And we're basically following the route of the ditch at the moment. And all you can see is basically canopy cover. Um, it's mainly top, dominated top. by willow. And at the top right here, we just got Hatchmere Lake coming into view. Uh, but it's very uniform. The trees are all of a very similar age. Um, it's similar with a lot of woodlands right across Cheshire. We've paused a little bit there. Not much open canopy. And other than people kind of taking down trees, it kind of stays like that. As Martin froze. I think Martin might have froze, or I froze. One of us has froze. It'll kick back in in a second. Okay, Martin gone. His video has been kicked off, which leaves me in charge. Hang on, Martin. I'll pop back in in a second. He's on his way. So what we were hoping to show you with that video is that it's, it's a very uniform woodland. There are lots of trees, all very similar age, spreading right across the site. And what we're expecting to see is change in that. We're expecting to see trees coppiced, a lot of light opened up in the canopy. Sorry, I'm just letting Martin back in. He's coming through. Uh, I'll go through a few of the chat questions while we're waiting for Martin. Um, just reading it through. So Alan said he's really pleased that it's in Northwest Cheshire. As I mentioned, it's 
it's a catalyst really for kind of beginning more reintroductions. Um, what we'd like to see is kind of a, a functioning Cheshire where water is kind of doing something more for wildlife. It's doing something more for the environment, creating clean water. But we need to start by educating people and having something in Cheshire that we can take people to really achieve that. Um, opportunities for public. The enclosure is private, um, but we're going to run kind of guided events and beaver watching days and evenings. Um, kind of education facilities there so we can bring people in and show you kind of guided. So it won't be open access. Uh, you can walk around the circular footpath in Hatchmere and you can peer over the enclosure fence which borders public footpath. Uh, we've recently upgraded the footpath to boardwalk so you do have access there. Uh, someone's mentioned is it on FC land, Forestry England land? Uh, it's not on Forestry England land, it does border Forestry England land. Um, Yeah, so it's not on Forest England land, but borders. Um, we have kind of met with all our landowners around us and everyone seems really positive. We've held um, public consultation meetings and kind of met with people. Um, and what new mix of trees do you expect once beavers are in? Um, we're expecting kind of the age structure to change. So, Coppicing, I mentioned earlier on, is where you cut a tree at the base and it sends out new shoots. And then those new shoots will then be allowed to grow for a short amount of time until the beavers want to eat them again. But it's a lot easier to eat a small shoot than it is to fell an entire tree. So the same species. Uh, Favourite food is willow, um, which there's lots of on site, but they're not overly picky. Uh, they don't tend to go for softwood trees like pines and things like that. They're really high resin and sap content. Uh, we do have some spruce and pine trees on site and from what I've been told is that if they're in the way, if there's not enough food around, they may get fell those trees to make way for trees that they like. They kind of manage their habitat to suit their own food. Uh, there will be volunteer opportunities. If you're not already signed up for volunteer, as a volunteer for Trust, then have a look at that on our website. Uh, who will install the fence? We have a contractor installing the fence. It's quite a big project um, due to start as soon as we can um, raise our funds. Uh, we mentioned the River Otter. So there's further implications to that, but the fact that the government has said that they can stay. Um, it means quite a lot. The fact that we can have one population allowed in, the, in England um, that can be open and wild and allowed to spread suggests that more will be coming in England. We've gone through a lot of licenses to get where we are. Um, maybe this will become more structured and easy for other reintroductions. We basically have to get a license. Here's Martin. He's back. Hello, Martin. You're on mute. Here he is. There you go. I just thought I'd leave you in it there, Kev, see how you cope. Hello. I've done well, I think. Um, we were just going through some of the questions. So I've gone through the chat questions. Um, and we're just going through some of the Q&A questions. Right. Uh, one of the questions, which you might be able to answer, uh, why do you have to have a license to release beavers into an enclosure? Why do you have to have a license? Because at the moment, um, they're not a native species in the UK. So they're effectively like a, like a giraffe or a zebra. Um, although they are a native species in Europe, they're not, they're not, they're not a native species in, in England. And if you want to introduce a non-native species in England, you need a license to do it. And we're at the moment with, the, with this strategy, with Devon having introduced species into the wild, where we've now got this conflict because there are some wild beavers um, that are supposedly not a native in England. So the government will have to make a decision in the next, in the next quite quickly, 
whether they want to make them um, native species. And if they do, then you won't need a license. But, up, but until they make that decision, we will still need licenses for the introductions. Okay, and there's a message from Joe. Um, are there any really special trees at Hatchmere that you'll need to protect from beavers? So Martin mentioned earlier, as you can kind of um, put some mesh around the base of a tree to prevent the beavers from accessing it. And it's quite a helpful management technique. Um, I say it's 30,000 pounds worth of fencing going in, and if a beaver wants to fell a tree onto it, that could be an issue. Uh, part of our monitoring on site will kind of look for any mature trees that could potentially fall on the fence, and then we could just put a bit of mesh around those and protect them. There is uh, one veteran oak on site that we will protect. Um, so yeah, we can use kind of some of these techniques that have been tried, tried across Europe already on site. Uh, what happens to the silt left behind in ponds by beavers? Uh, it's effectively stored. Um, it sinks to the bottom. bottom. Um, it also gathers around the edges and then it's used by the plants that are in there. Um, you will end up with building up, but it can take a lot of time. Silt doesn't build up overly quickly in certain water sources. Um, fortunately for us, the fields kind of draining into Hatchmere, they don't get ploughed regularly, so we're not expecting huge amounts of silt. Uh, benefit to the moss area. Um, while mosses rely on clean water, really, um, and the cleaner that water can be, the better it'll be for the mosses. Um, and the more moss we have, the more moss we have on peat, it means that um, the more carbon we can store from the atmosphere. That's how peat works. So we're kind of actively, actively fighting climate change by storing carbon in our soils. Um, Kathy, plenty of tree species that beavers prefer for dam building and feeding. Um, I believe they favour willow and aspen more than anything. There's no aspen on site, but there is tons of willow. Uh, and willow has kind of a, an age structure to it. It gets quite big and leggy and tends to fall over. So coppicing willow is one of the best managements for it. And there is loads of it there. I did try and get a beaver tonight, Kev, but I'm afraid I only came up with a giraffe. Which, if you're interested, that would require a license if you wanted to reintroduce it. So I'm just going to keep it in my front room. No, I like it. Is it made of wood? It, it is. It is made of wood. So don't let it anywhere near any beavers. Right, it's appropriate then. Um, will we be planting vegetation within the enclosure to slow the flow of water? Um, from our point of view, we are basically going to release a pair of beavers, just two, a male and a female, and then we're going to leave them to it. We're going to monitor them. Uh, we've got a huge monitoring plan right across the site. So we're monitoring water levels. Um, we're monitoring butterflies, dragonflies, uh, aquatic invertebrates, birds, canopy cover, vegetation surveys, everything. So the plan is just to leave the beavers to do their natural processes to do do their feeding behavior and then let things happen. No plans for planting anything. Uh, someone mentioned when kids arrive, Martin, uh, do they need their own area or does the family just grow and grow? What's our plan for kids? Uh, I think we, um, we let them have a family until the carrying capacity of the site is reached. So we, are, we luckily enough, there is a there is kind of a lot of expertise out there now in in managing beavers on site. So, if you like, we join a, a kind of club of of beaver owners across the country, whom we will be able to learn lessons from in terms of what would be the appropriate time to to remove a kit. When 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 do we need to in, increase the size of the enclosure? What other options have we got for managing the family? But I would have thought we've got enough. Um, area in our current enclosure for, for at least one or two generations of beavers to, to live quite happily. But the other, th the other, the other benefit of, of where we are now with the beavers is that um, if we do have excess beavers, we can perhaps breed them with beavers from another enclosure somewhere else in the country and start to build up a, a robust gene pool for the beavers in, in the UK and start to build up our own population. 
So we're not really doing this, this project in isolation. We're doing it in partnership with a whole bunch of other people. In, in the map I showed you earlier, work with these other partners to, to, to start to build up a, a homegrown UK-based beaver population. Okay. Um, question come on in. So someone said, uh, are beavers a protected species in the UK? Um, no, we've got separation between England, Scotland and Wales. So it's, they're protected in Scotland and in protecting them, they've basically made them effectively sort of an endangered species because the numbers are really small. Uh, in the UK, they're not currently living wild other than a few sites which are close to monitored. And I think it's early days for that. I think ask that question again in another 12 months and we'll see. Yeah, I think the, the, at the moment the government is just having to, to wrestle with that question. So eventually the, the beavers in Scotland would arrive in England because they would follow the watercourses and they would, they, would, they would come. So the government really needs to make its mind up whether they're native or not. The same in England, there is, we've got this unusual situation of there being a beaver population on the river Wye, which some of you may know, is the, acts as the border between Wales and England goes down the middle of the river. So a beaver on the left-hand side of the river is actually a Welsh, Welsh beaver. When it comes across to the right-hand side, it's an English beaver. So we are going to need to have some kind of consistency across boundaries to know what to do about beavers. And, and the government, I think, will be looking at that in the next six months. Um, as a result of having said the Devon beavers are allowed to stay, we now effectively have a sort of a legal population of, of beavers in, in England. Which, which is untenable, really. So they're going to have to make some decisions about that. Um, Katie Greenwood has just posted a link to the crowdfunder on the chat, if anyone's looking for it. Um, and back to questions and answer. Um, how many babies? How many beavers do? How many babies do beavers? I can't say that quickly. How many babies do beavers? Could we have lots of beavers very quickly? What's the kind of reproduction rate? Uh, I don't think I don't think it's very high. It's perhaps one or two a year. So we might get we might get some some new ones next year. And of course, there is a chance they may not survive as well. Um, I mean, we're hoping that because they're inside the enclosure, they will be protected at least from being you know being run over by cars, like some of them have, some happened to some of them in Scotland. But, um, I would think that, I mean, our project is five years long, so we only have a license for five years. Um, and I would have thought that we would be able to keep most of those beavers within that five year period. We are hoping that within that five year period, the government will get its act together and possibly we'll be, they will be allowed to stay and we can perhaps just release them into the open. Um, but we'll have to see what, what decisions the government makes over the next couple of years. Okay, just looking through more questions. Uh, we're expecting quite rapid changes um, in kind of reducing the tree cover to then increasing vegetation on the ground, which should all happen quite quickly. Uh, if we're going to reduce uh, release in October, we'd expect kind of a hive of activity and felling, um, and then maybe in the spring we'll see quite a green flourish through the site. Um, we're monitoring kind of the the water quality and I expect it will take time because it can, it'll come out of the beaver enclosure but then it'll take time to filter through the wood, wet woodland and through the floating raised bog, the wet heathlands kind of reach the mere. Uh, we're not expecting a fast change. Do beavers hibernate Martin? Do beavers hibernate? I don't think so. What they do is they strip bark from trees and small branches and they bundle it together um, and store it underwater near to where their dens are. And they can basically reach this without leaving the water um, and without spending a lot of energy. So they do tend to nestle up on cold days, um, but yeah. will kind of build winter food sources. Yeah, they just maybe move more slowly in the winter, don't they? Yeah. Um, Here's a good one. Uh, what's next? Wild boar and pine martin? Well, um, we, well, I think that's the question I'm asking as well. I mean, some of you may know that Kent have just got a permission to start a project to reintroduce bison 
Um, I, th I think seriously, if we are going to restore um, the broken nature of the UK, we are going to have to take some uh, drastic steps to bring in large animals that can help to really change landscapes like beavers. So, so I would like to think, yes, you can expect to see more changes like this in order for us to recover the landscape. Let's get beavers in first, though. So we've got, we've got just got we've just got a few more minutes left before we're going to have to close out. But we've got a question. Here. Okay, Martin. Final question for you. Yeah. From Gemma. Have you thought of names for the beavers? Yeah, I thought we'd call them Martin and Kev. What do you reckon? <laughs> we could. Um, I think we have got um, we have got plans for 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 some kind of naming. We're not quite sure. Um, what, how are we going to do that yet? But part of the, the campaign to raise awareness about the beavers and to try and encourage people to give to help support their long-term management will be, to, will be a naming ceremony, if you like. Um, we're also hoping to start a sort of a journey for the beavers because we're getting them from Scotland and currently they're roaming around Scotland enjoying themselves. And um, how, the, how, they, how, they, how they will be translocated is that um, currently there's a, a, a beaver trapper out there <laughs> who is collecting the beavers that are causing a bit of a problem in Scotland. Um, and then those, those beavers will be translocated to new homes, if you like. So at some point in the near future, we should have an idea as to which, which beaver is gonna be ours. And we can kind of take pictures of it and you know, think about the, the personality of that beaver at that point. But um, we're, not, we're not quite there yet, but hopefully. I mean, if you wanna start giving them names, well, my kids wanna call it Justin, actually. Call them just, one of them Justin. Justin Beaver. Justin Beaver. Um, not sure how well that's going to go down. But, um, okay. So I think, I pretty much think we've, we've got as many questions as we can. Uh, just a question there about health of the beavers. Yep. As I say, we are working with um, national beaver experts who will, who will be on hand to look at them every year or so to see how they're getting on. Um, and we're also going to be training up staff to become um, more expert in these kinds of things. So hopefully this is going to be a great thing for Cheshire. We'll have, chance, we'll have opportunity to see them, we'll be running events. Um, and it, looking at it in a bigger picture, there may be other reintroductions within Cheshire and, and definitely across the country. So when I talked to the lady who's doing the trapping, she said there were sort of currently 18 um, potential sites in England that were looking at reintroductions. So it's news from the government about the, the change in policy and allowing the Devon beavers to, to remain. Could well open the floodgates for, um, for more reintroductions. Uh, we already know of one, at least one in Cheshire, who, who are interested in looking at it. So I think this is kind of the beginning of the curve for beaver reintroductions. And, it, and it's great that we can be part of that. And it's great that we can share that with, with, with members and hopefully to inspire new people who perhaps have nothing to do with Wildlife Trust to, to get involved as well. So as Kev mentioned, um, we have got these, the campaign running. Um, as a result of, after this webinar, we'll send you, send you a link, some of these uh, sites where you can support us, um, share them with your friends, get the news out there. Um, we're gonna be on telly tomorrow, I think. We're gonna be on the radio, so there's gonna be a lot of PR coverage. You'll hopefully hear a lot more about the Cheshire Beavers over the, over the coming weeks and months as we try and get these beavers in uh, before Christmas at least. So. So thank you for joining. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your questions. Thanks to Kev for filling in when the internet dropped out for some bizarre reason. And I was just left talking to myself about the, about the site. Um, and hopefully we will get that video up online. So I think maybe you missed it all, but um, we'll, we'll certainly try and get it up there so you can see what the site looks like. And if you want to keep in touch with the Beaver News, just drop us an email and we'll put you on a list for making sure you hear what's going on as, as soon as it happens. So thanks very much. Um, thank you very much and we shall hopefully hear from you again soon. Yes, yeah. please donate to our crowdfunder and I'll be posting some updates of how we're getting on on our social media. So thank Great. you. Thanks everyone. Good night. Thank you.